So we're going to talk about uh, Open Science Basics, copyright and licensing now. Uh, why is that one of the basics? Uh, because you can't open up something that you don't own the rights to and in the humanities realm, we mentioned that before, we very often don't own the rights to what we are working with. And that is where copyright, Urheberinnenrecht, uh, comes into play. And uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to give you a global perspective, a European perspective and an Austrian perspective on copyright, um, at least a little bit of context so that you understand how how these uh, layers of, 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 um, of legalness uh, interact with each other and what that entails. Um, also, uh, we, you, would, you would maybe say, well, why do I need to understand copyright? I just want to work with openly licensed content anyway. Um, one, that is probably not possible. And two, of course, you have to understand certain basics of copyright if you um, if you want to get into licensing or into using licensed material. If what I'm going to say is too quick or too little for you, there are actually two extensive videos, one on copyright and one on data privacy. Um, and those two are not really separable from each other in the context of research, unfortunately, because data privacy is much more, or at least I feel, more complicated or more um, more difficult to handle sometimes than copyright really is. Um, so if if you don't get enough information out of what I'm going to say in the next half hour, there are two uh, longer YouTube videos, one spoken by Walter Scholga and one by myself um, from last year's tool gallery on uh, legal issues in digital humanities. So you can check that out. And of course, uh, you can contact either of us. Uh, with concrete questions. Okay, so where do we start? We start on the very highest level. We start now with the Universal Declaration of, Uni of Human Rights. Um, this, uh, this is actually where, uh, on an international level, our copyright, um, at least uh, ideologically, emerges. In Article 27, it is stated that everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. So uh, there you have it. Open access is a human right, open access to all uh, cultural creations. But, and there is always that but, then there is part two of Article 27. And that says that everyone also has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests that result from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which they are the author. So there, copyright comes into play. So on the one hand, you have the protection of the community or of the users or of the recipients of a cultural creation and if I say cultural creation, of course, I mean a scientific creation as well, especially in the context of the humanities. Um, but then on the other hand, you have the protection of those who are the creators of that. And that is um, where we usually stand as researchers. We're right in the middle between this, between this role of the user and the author, because we are always, and that is the nature of, of, of scientific work, we build on others' work, so we are the users of others' work, but then, of course, we also create our own results, our own thoughts, and so we are the authors of works. So uh, we are in a, in a Janus-faced position, so that's a Janus head there. Um, a, a, a very nice illustration of, of well, of, of, of the situation that we're in, because we... Um, Usually when we are asked about our perspective on copyright, we take one of the two positions, um, then after a few minutes realizing that we're also in the other one. So um, we uh, have a very strong position of wanting our copyright protected and wanting uh, attribution for the works that we create uh, then being reminded that if we have strong rights as authors, that will also mean that it will make it harder for us to work with others' works. 
So uh, before we get into more detail, uh, let's, uh, let's get our terminology straight here. So I have used the term copyright um, equally as Urheberinnenrecht um, up to here. Now I am explaining to you that I will keep on doing that because copyright is just the term that we would use in the English language. But the concepts of copyright and Urheberinnenrecht are actually very different. Uh, Urheberrecht, Urheberinnenrecht, droit d'auteur is the European uh, tradition which puts the author person in the center of the concept of, of the idea of creation. So we as persons are the ones who are protected and that has consequences for how these laws work. So in the European traditions in, in France and, and well in all of um, well non-island Europe, uh, this, this is the dominant tradition, the Germanic legal tradition. Um, here we focus on the one who creates something while in the English speaking world and in the legal uh, concepts that emerge from that area. Similarly, European concept, European concept and concepts of areas that emerge from that. Um, so in the English speaking world, we uh, focus very much on who has the right to exploit the works. So copyright. Who is allowed to copy a work and who is allowed to mostly financially but also in other um, respects to benefit from that. So um, that has consequences uh, that I will come back to later. Um, between those two, uh, only seemingly, is IPR, intellectual property rights. We would, I feel like intellectual property rights uh, could sort of bridge the gap between these two concepts and express better uh, what Urheberinnenrecht means than copyright can. However, um, in general, the term IPR is used mo more for um, um, patents and, and that area of the law, which doesn't concern us all that much in the humanities. So uh, the two uh, legal systems that we have been talking about up to here, so. Uh, um, Anglo-Saxon tradition, Germanic tradition, are basically a, a civil law system and a common law system. So a civil law, codified law, is what we have in Europe, and then case law is how, how American law works, which you might be familiar with from all sorts of TV series, um, where you can see how, how the, what the lawyer says to the jury very much influences whatever happens in the end. This is a little different in Europe. Also, uh, three terms that we have to uh, understand the differences between are law, regulation, and directive. A law is something national, so a law is the law in a country. A regulation is something that the European Union suggests to all of its members to put into practice in their laws. And a directive is something that comes is also a European law that comes into effect immediately without the countries actually having to translate this into their national concepts. Um, that is important to know when we talk about the two most prominent uh, legal um, novelties that we are concerned with um, in, in the research area, but also as, a, as the interested public in the last few years, which is the general data protection regulation, GDPR, yes, um, on the one hand, so, which is about data privacy and then the copyright directive on the other, uh, copyright regulation, I'm getting confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, what are the main principles of Urheberinnenrecht? Um, the author, in, in European concepts and in Austria, uh, the author is a natural person. Why is that? Because uh, the Urheber, Urheberrecht is a, is a factual right. So my Urheberrecht is created, it follows the author's pen across the page. When I write something, when I create something and I put it into a physical form, then I have created it. I cannot say I have not created it because that's not true. And I can also not sell the fact that I created it because no one else can have created it because I'm, you see where I'm going. Um, 
So that is a very that is important to know, and it seems uh, silly to to um, to be so focused on this aspect. But it is important to understand that in the U.S. that is different. You can sell your copyright because this focus on the author person, on the natural person who creates, is not the given in the legal system in the U.S. So you can give away your Urheberinnenrecht in the U.S. That is possible. And you can also give it away to a, a legal entity that is not a natural person. So you can give it to an institution. I can never write something, create something that the Academy of Sciences as my employer would then be the author of. But in the U.S. I could. Second important concept, the work. What is a work? A work, so this is of course a quote from the Austrian Urheberrecht now and um, we are focusing on, on this Austrian law because uh, Urheberinnenrecht or any law in any case ends, is, is bound to the territoriality principle. So it ends at national borders. Of course it does because I can't say what law is in place in Germany. Makes sense, right? So uh, the quotes that you will see are all from the Austrian Urheberrecht. What is a work? So the work is what is protected by this law, by this right. But what is it? A work is a, an eigentümliche geistige Schöpfung. So it's a, a unique uh, mental creation. So it's important that it's unique. It's important that I did it with my mind. So I, there has to be an idea behind it. And unique means it has to be different enough from other ideas in order to be identified. And it has to be a creation. So it has to take some sort of physical form. Speaking, sound would be a physical form. So uh, I do have the Urheberinnenrecht to my speaking today. So it doesn't have to be written down anywhere, but it has to take some physical form. So I can't have the idea to write a brilliant book and then someone else writes it and I say, I would have written the same thing, so now it's my Urheberrecht because I've, I thought of it before. That doesn't count, of course. Um, and it's also uh, important to know that the work is not only protected as a whole. Also the parts of the work are protected. Um, that means that you can't just take a part and do something with it. So you can't take um, a, a substantial part of a text and reuse it in a different context. You can quote, but we'll get to that. How long does this protection last? 70 years after the author's death. So um, 70 years plus uh, whatever time it takes from the moment of death to the end of the year. After that, you can do anything with a creation. It is no longer protected. You can, um, you can use it as your own and publish it as your own, even under your own name. You are not even obliged to mention who originally created a work anymore. So for time reasons, I no, but I'm not skipping it because the story is nice. Uh, <laughs> who knows this picture? Monkey selfie. Who knows the story? Who wants to tell the story? <laughs> <laughs> Oma, would you tell us the story of the monkey selfie? A photographer gave his camera to this monkey and he somehow um, got it to work and made a picture of himself. And the photographer uh, tried to, uh, it was, I think it was uploaded to Wiki. Wikimedia, and then the photographer tried to uh, get it down or uh, get uh, money from it, um, and said he was the the urheber, and the uh, because the, the monkey cannot be the urheber because he is no he's not not a human. Exactly. And uh, um, I, I think it. Um, the ruling was uh, no one is the whoever in this case. In, in, in this case, so PETA, um, the, the Animal Rights uh, Association, they actually went to court about this and they said that all money that is made of this picture uh, would have to go to PETA and they would then um, <laughs> take care of it for the monkey and use it for um, uh, animal <coughs> protection projects, which I mean, I, 
I love the idea. Um, in the, I think in the end there was no ruling. There was a, a what's the English term? A vergleich. Settling. A settling. Thank you. Um, so there wasn't a definitive decision on this, but of course, uh, according to to Austrian Urheberinnenrecht, uh, and also by the way, the monkey is a she. Um, also, uh, in the US, the, the, a monkey cannot have uh, authorship copyright. But it, it is an interesting uh, mind play and also, uh, of course, was referenced um, by uh, Jan Böhmermann. With, I don't know, do you know the project where Jan Böhmermann made monkeys choose lines for his song Menschen leben tanzen Welt? Brilliant, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> uh, side note. Uh, okay, the Austrian perspective. So, uh, what are the author's rights? We have the Urheberrecht, Urheberinnenrecht on the one hand, which we have learned the basics about, and then we have the Sui Generis Datenbankrecht on the other hand, that works a little differently. Um, it is, however, also uh, in the larger uh, Urheberrecht. By the way, uh, Austrian law is not gendered, so it's actually Urheberrecht, not Urheberinnenrecht. Sui generis Datenbankrecht, so database rights, uh, say uh, that, so you can't really have the authorship of a database because data are facts and facts are not copyrightable. But a collection of data, still not copyrightable because it's still just a collection of facts, but if you have made a substantial investment, that's what the law says, uh, then it creates a sui generis Datenbankrecht for you. So you have rights to that database, to the protection of that database and the exclusive right to uh, financial, especially exploitation, um, also uh, to whatever usage that you want to allow or not allow to that database. What consequence does that have? That has the consequence that not only a natural person can own sui generis database, right, but also an institution. So um, if my work contract, and it does, says that the academy owns the financial rights, exploitation rights to the work that I do during my work time, and I contribute large amounts of data to a database, then I don't have any authorship rights to my contribution to that database, but the academy has the sui generis database right to the database because they are the ones, they, the institution, is the one who made the substantial investment for the database by paying me. The author or the sui generis database rights owner has the exclusive right to make copies, to, dis to distribute their work um, or to make it available, um, to um, also uh, to perform the works um, or show them in any way, uh, to send them in, in or di digitally transmit them in any way, uh, to decide if, it, if the work can be altered, modified, that also includes translations or not. Um, the title is protected and also um, you have the right to, uh, uh, for, uh, for your authorship to be attributed. You can, um, so the last, uh, last three, you cannot get rid of. All the other ones are exploitation rights. You can sell them, you can sell them to a publisher, you can implicitly sell them via signing a work contract to your employer. But the last three, if you are an author, you cannot get rid of them. You cannot get rid of your right to attribution. You, do, you are entitled to be anonymous or to have a pseudonym. You are allowed to have that, but you cannot get rid of your right to attribution. If you want to be attributed, you always can. That has consequences for licenses that you can or that you should apply. Um, uh, this is also uh, one important paragraph that researchers should be familiar with. Uh, Zweitverwertungsrecht um, for scientific publications. So this is unfortunately very specific. The similar a paragraph exists in the German Urheberrecht. Um, authors of scientific, uh, well, articles um, 
have the right to republish their article one year after it has been published in the medium where it was published under certain conditions and these are very specific. So this person, this author has to be member of the scientific staff of a, of a research facility that is at least uh, half, so at least half of the financing of the facility has to come from public money. So private universities, if you're employed at a private university, it probably doesn't apply. So that is the one aspect. So your employment situation is one aspect. And the other aspect is that uh, the article was published in a periodically published uh, journal, probably, that has to be published at least twice a year. So that is all very specific. But if you are employed at a public university and uh, you published an article in a regularly published journal, then you are allowed to republish it a year later. Well, that's something, not very much. What, what else can we do with protected works? Um, and that is per se all works. If, if they are not explicitly licensed, um, all works have to be considered protected by regular copyright. But there are exceptions that also apply to all works protected under regular copyright, things that you can still do. Um, vorübergehende Vervielfältigungshandlungen. So you can reproduce temporarily for uh, technical reasons, because if you view anything online, then you're technically reproducing something on your machine that is actually based somewhere else. And that is a, just a technical necessity, so that is legally allowed. Um, and for private uses, you can make as many copies as you like. Um, you are allowed to quote. Um, of course, you have to cite uh, where, where your quote is coming from. Um, and you are not allowed to change it without uh, making it visible that you changed something. Um, also, the extent of a quote, we don't have explicit re regulation how large or how long a quote is allowed to be. Um, but there is one case where a person uh, wrote a thesis um, and in this thesis actually republished an entire work. It was a, an old, um, I think, literary work and this person would write in their thesis, the work begins um, and then quote two pages. It then continues and quote two more pages and by that this person managed to republish an entire text. Of course, um, yeah, that doesn't work. So that's not, <laughs> that is not uh, a quote anymore. Um, the use of, of, um, of, uh, of, of orphan works, um, that is a separate issue. Ask me if you want, but it's very specific and it's, uh, it's a nightmare. But if I can, but it would, need, would require me to, to explain quite a few things. So I'm not doing that now, but if you want to know, ask me. Um, and of course, uh, reproduction for use in teaching is allowed and for non-commercial research. Um, we do not, brackets yet, have a text and data mining clause in Austrian Urheberrecht, but we will have one soon, thanks to the EU, I will explain in a minute. In Germany, text and data mining for non-commercial research is already allowed. I have to speed up and I don't know how. I'm skipping fair use. Ask me if you want to know. Not relevant for the European context. Not a thing here, it's only in the US American context. Global perspective, the bigger picture, what international treaties do we have? We have these, they're all very great. Ask me if you wanna know, it's not really important in the narrower sense. European perspective, the EU digital agenda. Um, there were a number of EU directives um, that uh, shaped the way that Urheberrecht Influ is, is in the digital realm um, is, is today, uh, well, the situation that we have today. Uh, one uh, very important one was the database directive, very important for, for the digital humanities especially. Um, also, what I told you about databases is a consequence of that directive. Uh, Orphan Works directive, a nightmare, as I said. Then there was a green paper, a commission communication, and finally a proposal for a directive 
directive, not a regulation um, on copyright in the digital single market. Um, directive means it has to be implemented in the national laws before it comes into effect and doesn't go into effect right away like the GDPR did. So uh, this is actually, it's an old slide that I used when the directive had not yet been in place. Um, and I just changed the last line so it now is in place. In June it went into effect. Um, so uh, next step is that the member states now have I think one or two years to implement in their national laws what the directive says. What does it say? It says a lot of things. The most controversial aspects that you might have heard about were articles um, 11 and 13 as they were in the media now in the published version articles 15 and 17. Um, the one was about ancillary copyright. Uh, so that was um, the qu more popularly known as the link tax. So this is about uh, the allowing or not allowing of platforms such as Google, but also others, to show uh, snippets of works um, with links. Um, that was, that was a, a big issue. And the other thing was the question of upload filters. Um, both articles were uh, put into place and put into effect despite the controversial discu discussions. So we'll see how that uh, will be implemented in the end. Though, uh, as far as I know, there are already new discussions open, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, most positive, most important positive aspects for our context are that the uh, data, text and data mining permission that Germany already has was also included into, into this uh, commission uh, proposal, into this directive. Though interestingly, um, the sharing of the text and data mined corpora is still not allowed, um, which is interesting because what should I do? I, you're not even allowed to share it within a team. So if I text and data mine a corpus, that is probably a quite large corpus because why else would I use this extensive or make the investment to use this technology and text and data mine a large corpus. So now I have a large corpus and now I'm not allowed to share it with my team. So how am I supposed to process it, how to work with it? So will the German law um, did allow sharing in teams for non-commercial research. So it's an interesting, an interesting aspect. Of course, um, also positive aspect there is uh, the permission for archives and um, archiving institutions, libraries, etc., uh, to preserve cultural heritage uh, in digital forms after the protection ends. Um, in the details, of course, also uh, some problems there. Yeah, you probably have noticed that these slides are licensed under a under a what? Who knows? Thank you. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's what it, that's what it says. So um, we're moving on to licensing. I have three minutes. That's doable. So <laughs> these slides are licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license CC. By is the best license, Creative Commons are the best licenses. Why? Who of you has heard of Creative Commons? Who of you has were heard about the DPPL? Yeah, the Erschebitz favorite table. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course you have not heard about the DPPL. Why? Uh, these are very specific German, very interesting concept for licenses, but very specific uh, German context, also optimized for German law. Um, you all know Creative Commons, or many of you do, and that is what makes them so powerful, because you are not going to read the legal text, so all the Creative Commons licenses have actual valid legal texts behind them, but what they also have is a one-sentence explanation that says, this license allows you to do this. They have recognizable logos that all of you can recognize, if you look at my slides, for instance. So the power of Creative Commons is that if I use a Creative Commons license, you actually know what you are allowed to do with my stuff. If I use a different license that is more specifically suited to the very individual nature of my very specific material, then that might be legally 
more valid or, or, or cleaner, but it doesn't help you because you're not able to read the legal text and neither am I. So I might put a legal text there that I don't even understand myself. So that doesn't help anyone. What can you license? You can license any work. What can you, if you own the rights to it, that is, of course, so you can license your own work. Um, of course, you have to be aware if you're allowed to license. I mentioned before, my work contract says that I do not own the exploitation rights to the works that I create at work, which also means that I cannot give them away. I cannot put a Creative Commons license on my slides without the permission of the Academy, which is also the start of the story why I thought that it would be useful for the ACDH to have an open policy, because I thought I want to license my work and I want some policy to say that I can. So that is what you have to consider. Of course, you also have to consider what kind of contracts you signed with uh, publishers, publishing houses. You also have to consider if you author the work yourself or if you did it together with someone who also has the equal amount of rights to the whole work. What can you not license? Works that are not protected by copyright anymore. So any work that is in the published public domain, so the author did more than 70 years. And as I said, raw data. Data are facts. Facts are not protectable. Facts are facts. What is a license? Um, a quote from uh, Walter Scholger and my favorite, yeah, I have told this a billion times, a uh, quote from one of our favorite or our favorite uh, legal expert in the digital humanities sector, Pavel Kamotsky, brilliant mind. He said, a license is a formalized promise not to sue. And that's what it is. Yeah, we're gonna skip that. You already understood that Creative Commons are the best licenses. These are the different elements of Creative Commons licenses. BY stands for attribution. So if I put CC BY, then that says you have to name me as the author of the original work and if you do that, you can do anything with my stuff. If I say uh, by SA, so SA stands for share alike, that means copy left for the programming, people from the programming world. Um, that means you can have my stuff, you have to say that you have it from me so that it is created by me. You can do with it whatever you like, but whatever you create on the basis or using my stuff, you have to share under the same conditions. The same conditions would again be the same license, so also the share alike module. So that means it's a viral license. So that would mean the next content would be open as well, and the content based on that would be open as well, and we think that that is a good idea, right? In theory, yes. In practice, it means that you cannot combine data that are licensed CC by SA and data that are licensed CC by because you cannot combine the more open license and make the stuff uh, and close the stuff more than it was before. So you can't get those two together because the one data set requires you to stay as open as possible and the other data set requires you to put a condition on the data. It doesn't go together. Um, and the, but still uh, pretty open, pretty okay. Then we have two more elements that one of them is no derivatives. So you can take my work, you have to share it in the same way or not, but you are not allowed to alter it. Well, why would you then republish is question one. Um, number two, so that would mean if you took these slides, use them in your university course, for instance, you could, but you would have to use the entire slide set. You can't take one slide because the slide set as a whole is licensed with the no derivatives license, so you can't change it. That means you also can't take a part of it and only reuse that. And uh, non-commercial use, um, you're probably familiar with this argument. If you limit the reuse of your stuff with the non-commercial use element of the Creative Commons licenses, then the consequence can be that the stuff that you create cannot be used by, for example, uh, wiki projects, because in some countries uh, the wiki um, infrastructure is uh, commercial. Also, um, many American universities, many uh, universities outside of Europe and even in Europe 
are private, are uh, therefore also commercial enterprises and would therefore not, uh, not be allowed to reuse your stuff. Um, so you're not only limiting the, the economic exploitation in, in, the, like in the classic sense, but also the reuse of your stuff for research purposes. Public domain mark means that you are taking data that is already in the public domain and informing people that that is the case. So you cannot attribute a public domain mark. You can only mark something that is already in the public domain as such. In contrast to that, the CC0 license means um, no attribution is required, but not because this stuff already is in the public domain, but because I have the rights and I'm putting it there. We cannot refrain from our right to attribution in the European uh, legal systems, or most of them. Therefore, we are creating a legal um, uncertainty for those who want to reuse stuff. If we put stuff in, in the public domain, which we actually can't. So if I decide to license these slides with a CC0 license, and I, can, and I say, you can reuse this without naming me as the author, and I change my mind in 20 years, according to the Austrian Urheberinnenrecht, I can. So I could sue you in 20 years if you reused my stuff in the meantime. So as the scientific community bases its work and progress on, the, on attribution systems anyway, I don't really see the point in attributing CC0 uh, if, if um, if we can just use CC BY. Sometimes we have the argument that databases should be made available CC0 well. Uh, yeah, that we can do. Here you have a systematic overview um, of this whole system that I just explained and you can also see which licenses are compatible and which are not. You can't attribute all of them together if you Want to know why you can't do that? Ask me. Two tools. The public license selector is a tool developed by the Czech Clarin Lindat. Um, uh, one of the authors of this tool is the aforementioned Pavel Kamotsky. Um, it's a very simple tool that just makes you answer a series of questions. You can either license data or code with this tool and you can just you know click through the questions, answer them and then in the end the tool informs you what licenses you are legally able to attribute um, to the source that you are trying to license. Uh, unfortunately, um, especially when it comes to software licensing, uh, you might uh, pretty soon end up on a page that says, you're re reusing softwares with non-compatible licenses, please contact the software owners. Mm -hmm. Well, if that happens, well, then that is the case can sometimes happen, that is unfortunate, but then you should, you know, get in touch with the software owners. And uh, one thing that Martina pointed me to uh, just a few days ago, the right statements, rightstatements.org, um, a pretty useful page that um, makes available in a more uh, useful and pretty way than they were before the uh, public rights statements that Europeana also uses for marking their content, the content that is available on Europeana. There are some aspects to the rights statements that are problematic. For example, uh, you can mark um, resources with these rights statements and you can say, this is in copyright, but use for teaching is allowed. Well, in European copyright systems, use for teaching is allowed anyway. So uh, it's, it, it creates uncertainty to attribute this in some cases. Um, but uh, in principle, they provide 12 uh, different right statements and most of them are pretty useful, so um, check that out. But uh, however, it, it might be quite useful to be familiar with this as researchers, but the intended usage is uh, basically for cultural heritage institutions. So it might be useful to, to know these because cultural heritage institutions might use them, but you are not the primary target audience of these, of these licenses. So they are 
uh, to be used for already existing cultural heritage that is digitally available. Here is some reading and that's it. Yeah, 10 minutes plus. Do you have questions?